In this screencast, I'm going to show you how to fit a data set of plasma drug concentration time data to a pharmacokinetic model. And we're going to compare a one compartment model to a two compartment model and see, um, and I'm going to demonstrate how we judge whether uh, which of those two are the best fit for the data set that we have. Now, um, this is very introductory. The whole question of data fitting and um, modeling is a whole different course. But this is an introduction um, because we've spoken now about two compartment models as well and an introduction into how, how to use Phoenix um, WinNonLin to fit or to do pharmacokinetic modeling or to fit a pharmacokinetic model to a data set. Up to now we've been simulating data sets using Phoenix but now we're, we have an, an experimental data set and we're going to fit a pharmacokinetic model to those data. So we have a data set from one animal and it's a typical time in minutes. Um, often these data sets are time in hours um, but in this case, it's time in minutes again, um, and we have concentration, our concentrations in this column, and we have our units, which is important because that helps us determine the units of our parameters as well. And the first step is always to plot your data with a simple XY plot, and this helps us to just get a sense of what our data looks like. It also helps us to to make sure that there aren't, haven't been any mistakes in our data entry because if there were mistakes then we may get funny outliers or, or the shape of our time concentration curve just doesn't look right. So um, this gives us an opportunity to just, just get an overview of our data. Time is always X, concentration is Y, and then we have ID because we only have one animal it doesn't really matter what we do with ID but if we had Numerous animals, we may want to use ID as a group variable or as a page sort variable. Group variable will plot all the data on one graph, but the different animals will have different colors. Page sort will plot the data for each individual animal on a, on a separate page. So let's run this. And here we have our data. We can see that there doesn't seem to be anything amiss. We have time versus our concentration. Now something that I want to point out as well is that um, this time concentration profile seems to have a pretty steep portion here and then it becomes less steep here. So it's not a smooth exponential decay but there, there seems to be um, may, maybe a difference in, in uh, between this portion of the curve and that portion of the curve. Now we, what we can do is also transform the y-axis to a logarithmic to the log a logarithmic scale and that can give us a better sense if there is truly a difference in the slopes between the initial and the termin terminal portions and we start seeing that this is possible. So this is our first clue that um, maybe a one compartment model is not the correct model for these data um, or the best fit model to fit to these data. Our next step once we've plotted is actually to start to to send this data to WinOnLin 5 Classic Modeling choosing a PK model so that we can start um, looking if we can fit a PK model to these data. So we choose PK model. Now you'll see, we know that um, these data were generated through giving a the drag as an IV bolus to this animal so we have various options for models to choose and we are limited to the IV bolus models because that's what we used and we have uh, the the three different options for IV bolus is one compartment, two compartment and three compartment and you'll notice that for the two compartment within the two compartment there are also two options micro and macro I will talk about that a little bit later. So I'm um, choosing the one compartment model first. We start off with the one compartment model. We choose that. Um, we move down to dosing. Um, and we will choose check internal worksheet because we want to enter our dose by hand. Our dose was given at time zero. And we know for this data set that it was a total dose of 100 micrograms it was given. It wasn't given on a milligram per kilogram basis. So we enter a total dose of 100 micrograms here. The other thing that you see that we do in this tab is weighting of the data. Now what this means 
is <clears throat> we have time concentration data and those concentration values span a, a pretty wide range. And when we are fitting a model, we are fitting that model using re a regression analysis, um, a nonlinear regression analysis, but a regression analysis nonetheless. And what a regression analysis does is that it varies the values of the parameters for that model, predicts data using, using those different parameter values, and then determines what the difference is between the predicted values and the observed values. And then it continues to vary the value of the parameters and continues to do that until the difference between the predicted and the observed values is minimized. And then that is the value for the parameters that the, that the program will converge on and um, return as the, the estimated values for the parameters for that model. Now, if we do not weight the pharmacokinetic data because it spans such a wide range, the regression analysis will put more emphasis on the, the data that has the higher value simply because those differences will be larger in value just by virtue of the fact that, that those data have higher absolute values. So this is why we typically will weight the data either by the reciprocal or the reciprocal of the square of the value of the data, so that we put less emphasis on those high values. Um, so the choice of weighting is, is, is a subtle one, and um, I'm not going to go into it any further in this course. It's, it's a subject for, for a course that's focused on modeling and model fitting, but um, this is what we do. Um, then the next uh, option in this uh, list are the initial estimates. Now remember previously when we were using Phoenix, we used Phoenix to simulate data and in those cases we had to enter estimates for or we had to enter values for the parameters of your model because we didn't have any observed data to fit the model and estimate the parameter values and we wanted to be able to simulate data. In this case we have data so we don't need to enter initial estimates. We have the option to enter initial estimates if we have them either from literature or previous study, or if we have um, done our homework and and um, fit data, uh, fit these data, started doing our modeling by hand using Excel and linearization by log transforming and residual analysis and um, um, etc. as we've spoken about in our previous lectures, um, determining the slopes of the data, uh, back extrapolating to the y-axis. Um, in this case, we have a fairly uh, good data set with enough, with lots of information and it's clean. There's not a lot of variability in the data. So we are going to take a chance and we're not going to enter initial estimates um, and see how that works out. So. Um, usually it's a good idea to enter your own uh, initial estimates and there you will select this. Use an internal worksheet and enter those values. Um, in this case we are not going to do it. Uh, you can also um, select whether you want to supply bounds or use win on, let win on lin select the bounds. These are the bounds within which the nonlinear regression algorithm will select randomly or, or continue to select um, options for the values of the parameters in that iteration of predicting and then calculating the sum of squares and, and predicting again to see to minimize those sums of squares. But in this case we're also going to let win on then um, select the just determine those bounds itself. Then we have units and it's good to check the units because if um, it tells us if we've given the program enough information to know what the unit should be for each of the parameters. We see here that all these blocks are filled, so we have. If any of these blocks are empty, we need to go back and make sure that we've entered all our units in all the options where there are units to enter. So now we're ready to run the program. All right, and we see that there are, this returns a whole lot of different files in terms of the output data and output plots. Once again, it's beyond the scope of this course to go through each of these um, files in detail, but I'm going to highlight what I think are the most important ones for you to focus on. 
if you do 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 this um, and then um, also the most important plots so uh, the first is the diagnostics so this uh, gives us some information about the model fit. Um, so these are the sums of squares that were minimized by the program in fitting the data, uh, the model to the data. We have degrees of freedom here, which is, um, it tells us if we have enough, we, we, we don't want to have, um, you know, we want to have enough data for the number of parameters that we're fitting. Um, and the the rule of thumb is that you want for the number of parameters, which is two for one compartment model, right? Remember, um, it's volume of distribution and your half-life or, or volume of distribution and clearance. So they're two parameters um, that you need to fit. Um, so two plus an, plus an additional two. So a minimum of four degrees of freedom. And we see that we have more than enough degrees of freedom here for our model, at least 12. We have 12, so that's more than enough. And then we have these two criteria here, which are the uh, Kaiki's information criteria and the Schwartz's Bayesian criteria. Um, and the, the, the basic rule of thumb here is the smaller the better. And notice that these are negative values. So the larger negative value is better for these two criteria. Then we go to our final parameters for for the model, and as you notice, just two parameters because it's a one compartment model, your volume of distribution and your KL10 or your elimination rate constant. Um, and these are the values that that the program has converged on and said are the best estimates for these parameters for this model for these data. Notice here that um, you have a CV percent, and this is not the variability in the population because we only have one animal. This gives us the um, the level of confidence that we can have in these estimates. Um, in other words, this is the best estimate, plus or minus um, this amount of, of variability. So this is the range within which these values would would. Um, we can be fairly certain that this estimate falls within this range. The same here. And and we don't want this variability to be very high. Uh, a general thumb, rule of thumb is a CB percent of 20 is acceptable. Above 20, we start really doubting whether we have enough information to accurately um, estimate, estimate what the value of these parameters should be. Then we also notice that we have secondary parameters. So these are all the other or parameters that were not calculated as primary parameters for this model. Uh, so we notice we have an area under the curve here, and this is the same as the area under the curve extrapolated to infinity for a non-compartmental analysis. This is the elimination half-life, the maximum drug concentration, the clearance. Um, and because this is IV bolus, the Cmax will also be the C0, or where the curve um, crosses the y-axis, area under the moment curve, mean resonance time, and the volume of distribution at steady state. And notice that because this is a one compartment model, this value is the same as this value. Then we go on to the plots, and um, this is the plot that most of us like seeing, where we have our time versus concentration data. Um, and we have our predicted curve, and already when we look at this, we start doubting whether a one compartment model is a good fit because we see here we're under predicting the data, here we're over predicting the data, and here we're under predicting the data again. So, this nice, smooth, mono exponential curve is just not doing a good job of encapsulating this portion of the curve and this portion of the curve at the same time. So, it's kind of finding a middle way. But the only way that it can find a middle way and still minimize the sum of squares is by um, by kind of getting something in the middle which underpredicts and then overpredicts and underpredicts again. And then we see this um, in in this graph very in this figure very nicely where we see here we are underpredicting, then we're overpredicting again, and then we're underpredicting again. We don't want we what we want to see with this, and this is the observed concentrations versus the predicted concentrations. This is the unity line, or should be the unity line, and we want these data points 
these observed data points to fall pretty close to the unity line and at the very least be be randomly scattered around this unity line and this is definitely not a random scatter there is a pattern to this and that's not a very good sign um, and then we can also look at the residuals and here again there's this lovely wave pattern which is not something that we want so now and this all suggests that we should try a two compartment model as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it into my work file. <clears throat> I'm going to rename this as two compartment. And now I'm going to select the IV bolus for a two compartment. Now, whether we choose a micro or macro does not really matter. It's the same model. Um, we, however, when when you determine your initial estimates by curve stripping and the residual um, methods that we 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 spoke about in this module six um, and and that you read about in your readings for module six, you'll notice that the parameter values that you estimate in that way are the a, b, alpha, and beta, and these are the macro constants. So if you want to enter those values that you calculated by hand as your initial estimates, then the macro constants are the best, is the best option to choose. Notice that if you do choose this option, um, <clears throat> no, um, don't worry about that. <clears throat> so we have this selection um, and we'll choose the micro for this case. Um, once again, we've mapped time and concentration. We can sort by ID, especially, or we need to sort by ID if we have more than one animal's data. We only have one, but let's sort anyway um, so that we don't forget to do it if we um, get to have more than one animal. Once again, we need to enter our dosing. Our dosing has not changed. We'll let the program select the initial estimates um, for us again so we won't worry about that and then here are our units notice also that we've kept the dosing scheme the same again uh, the, the weighting scheme is uh, the same again and now we're ready to run and here we see already a much better fit we don't have that over prediction under under prediction, over prediction, under prediction. We have a curve that um, is is not a smooth mono exponential decay, but seems but is bi exponential um, because we chose a bi exponential model, um, and this is doing a good job of of addressing these differences between the initial and the, and, and the later portions of the curve. But let's look at these files again. So we look at the diagnostics, and we see here as well we have a great decrease in the Akaki's information criterion and the Sportis Bayesian criterion. So this is good news. We're on the right track. Our degrees of freedom have gone down by two because we've we've selected a two compartment model which has two more parameters. So we've lost some degrees of freedom but we still have plenty. So we're not worried about this. And these are sums of squares which are less because we have a better fit in the model. Here are our final, final parameters. So notice we have a volume of the central compartment, K10, K12, K21. So we have four parameters instead of two. These are our estimates for those parameters. And notice our CV percents are really nice and low. Uh, we have no concern that we have about our certainty in those parameter estimates. Uh, we have secondary parameters to look at. Um, so all the other parameters that, that are associated with the two-compartment model will be here. So the, the volume of distribution at steady state, the volume of your peripheral compartment or your second compartment, um, your clearance, your clearance to the second compartment, um, your alpha betas, your K10 half-life or your elimination half-life, etc. Um, and then we we've already we landed on this when we were done so this is great um, let's look at this sorry this one here and we we have removed that that wave like pattern this has become a true unity line um, and we are predicting our concentrations very nicely so much better here too and we've lost that wave like pattern in our residuals so with that 
um, that's just a quick dip into how to fit um, a data set to to a PK model using Winnobl. Um this is of, of course a very nice clean ideal data set that I used for this demonstration and you will have a similar kind of data set to use for your assignment. Um, so with that thank you very much.